eye is blue, <laughs> itching to be outside, tired of being locked inside. Yeah, it's going to hit like 70 degrees today. Yeah. yeah, I was in the 60s yesterday. It was amazing. Yeah, I think it's going to get a little chilly again over the weekend, but we're only going to have a couple more of those, I hope. Um, and, it, you know, spring is really starting to uh, to make its presence known. Yeah. Yeah, my six-year-old likes to go out every morning and count the spring, which, <laughs> which means he's counting the bulbs that have popped up. So mm -hmm. that's his tracker on on how close we're getting. So Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah. And Utah announced yesterday that everyone 16 and older um, will be receiving the COVID vaccine starting April 1st. Good. Okay. So that's, that's progress. I'm, I'm looking yep. forward to, um, especially with the CDC uh, guidelines that came out earlier this week, that two fully vaccinated people could hang out together without masks and without social distancing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really looking forward to like just hanging out, man. Oh <laughs> like yeah. Going I, I to totally a restaurant, just like, you know, the simple things I, you know, everyone, not everyone. I mean, there's been a lot of frustration with, with, with the COVID lockdowns and, and trying to understand what it is we are and aren't supposed to be doing. But I will say that I have never felt more balanced and calm in a long time. Like, okay. It just, you know, we're not over scheduled. We're not running to like 50 soccer matches and all these different things and doing, you know, it's like, it seemed like we were, constantly go, 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 go running from one thing to the next. And this mm -hmm. slower pace, I'm, I kind of don't want to see it go away. Like I want, <laughs> I want the ability to go out. I want to be in Vegas. I want to go to conferences. I want to hang out mm -hmm. in restaurants with friends, but man, I, I don't want to go back to like the rat race hustle and bustle. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have really been enjoying this like slower lifestyle. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a total introvert. And even I, I'm like, I'm itching to get back out and see, yeah. like, I, you know, you know, I, I total, I do see your point about the slower lifestyle, but like, I'm, I'm itching to get out and do things. Yeah. Like I'm itching to go back to a baseball game. No, I mean, I think, I, I think definitely have having the ability and appreciation of those things that were kind of taken from us um, mm -hmm. and, and doing those things. So, I think there there will be, and for myself included, I think there will be a bit of a binge go on when it mm -hmm. like feels like you can just go do all the things that you couldn't do. I think there will definitely be a binge, but for me, I'm hoping that I I find some balance where I I keep some of those slower things where it's not about not going out and doing things, but it's doing them in in more moderation and and not just every day being fully scheduled from seven a.m. to ten p.m. Um, mm -hmm. For at least for me, that just wasn't a healthy place to be, you know. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. But I'm, I just want to sit in a restaurant. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so. I, I just, I just want to hang around with friends. I, I want yeah. to see that. I mean, there's a whole bunch of friends we haven't seen in you know at this point a year. Yeah, I, I think we're the same. And I was thinking about it yesterday. Um, and, you know, people are kind of doing their own thing and, and managing their own thing, which I, I think is, is fine. But um, for me, and I, and I thought about this because I, um, I pulled all my finances. I got long hair isn't fun because it got <laughs> in your mouth. Side note, there, I, I found like a torture device because I, it used to be walking around with my wired headphones and my phone in my pocket, getting it caught on like a knob, like a doorknob or a drawer mm -hmm. pole, and it like rips the headphones out of your head. That really made me angry. I found something that makes me even more angry. It's okay, trying to I'm eat. Listening. It's trying to eat and a piece of hair getting in your mouth while you're trying to eat. It just <laughs> infuriates me. I'm like, you stupid hair. If you want to stick around, you're going to stop doing that. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Um, no, I totally lost my train of thought. Rewind it. I don't know where I was. I don't know where I yeah, was. Yeah, I'm going. trying. Yeah. It didn't matter. I think. It doesn't matter. I don't know where I was going with that. Uh, no yeah. Yeah. So what's what's new in your world? Um, 
starting to um, help my parents get ready to downsize. They're they're looking to move sometime. How are they? Yeah. I mean, they've been talking about it for a good four to five years. <clears throat> but just like everywhere else, the real estate market is hot here right now. Mm -hmm. And so they're still living in the house that we all grew up in. So four bedroom house, finished basement, all of that. And I mean, at this point, it's like they're, they no longer need all of that space. So they're looking for like a two to three bedroom rancher mm -hmm. um, where they've got, you know, the space for you know their various hobbies, but they don't necessarily have to maintain a large house. Um, so this past weekend we went over and we started um, moving some of their stuff out. So they're trying to declutter the house a bit so they can put it up on the market soon. They have a real realtor coming tomorrow. So right. like my mom had turned the basement into a craft room and she's like, I got to make it look like Michael's just didn't come in and throw up. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So it was stuff like that. So we were moving that kind of stuff to my sister's house and storing that stuff in her basement. She's got extra space in her basement right now. And then of course it turned into not just moving their stuff out that they, you know, the extra stuff out, but it's like, no one's touched this in 10 years. Let's get rid of it. Um, this is something I haven't touched in 25 years. It can go in that, that kind of yeah. stuff. So it turned into, into a bit of that. All right. Well, good fun. Um, so, I mean, that, that's probably the, the big thing on that. Like just life is, life is moving on. Like, um, in less than a month, I'm going to have a two year old. It's crazy. And it's absolutely batshit insane how fast that time went. I know. I know. It seems like yesterday. It was. Um, yeah. And other than that, just, you know, work, work is keeping us busy, which is good. Yeah. Busy is good. It's better than the opposite. So yeah. I'd rather, I'd rather deal with the frustrations of busy than the frustrations of boredom for sure. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So What's our topic today. Well, that's the thing. I was trying to think of a good segue and I really don't have one. So I'm kind no. of stumped with a good segue. Sometimes um, that happens. But it's it, it's a continuation of the conversation we had last time. So where we wrapped up last time, we started talking a bit about social media and talk you know, and we, we started to touch on a bit and we decided, you know what, this is a whole conversation in and of itself. You know, the the toxic nature or the the toxic cesspool that social media has has become. Yeah. You know, like the current state of it is undeniable. It's, it's a cesspool, a lot of tribalism, a lot of toxic behavior. Um, people they're you know, feeling the effects of that. Um, and while there's definitely gonna be some people that disagree with this, we're, we'll, we'll start off with this caveat, you know, we, social media started out, you know, with, with good intentions, you know, the, the, the intention of enabling faster and better communication, uh, amongst people, uh, making it easier to communicate pe with people and share, share, share things and share information. Um, but what we see today is, is not that, you know, social media now allows people to isolate themselves in bias confirming echo chambers instead of thoughtful debate. Um, Anybody who has an opposite, you know, has a differing opinion. Again, instead of any kind of thoughtful debate, there's a lot of shelling, sh uh, shouting, fighting, arguing, and, and whatnot. Um, and I, the biggest thing that I've noticed is, is it's devalued friendships um, to the point where they just, it just, it's a matter of counting, you know, the number of friends, the number of likes, the number of shares, the number of retweets. Yeah, it, relationships have devolved and been devalued into, into that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, how did we get here? And, you know, like, is there some place to go and not just the newest platform, you know, there, there's, there's always going to be a new platform, but like, not just, you know, when I talk about where do we go and not just moving to some new platform, um, like, is there somewhere to go? Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, part of this and where we were talking about this last week is, is, you know, my wife is doing a bit of a social media cleanse at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at this point, I've really disconnected from, from social media. I found it like very unhealthy in my, in, in my own life and in our life. You know, sometimes I just find myself sitting there doom scrolling, you know, look, you know, just seeing has anything, one, has anything changed or just constantly scrolling through the news feed and not actually talking with people, not actually communicating. Yeah. Um, 
And then the next question to get us started, um, I would like to know from you, because I know you're, you, you leverage social media for both the company uh, and your own personal purposes, you know, over say the last 10 to 15 years, has your, you know, has your view of social media changed? If so, um, how? I need a, I need a notebook and paper to write down all the notes. So I remember everything that I want to, I've got it written right here. All, all the, <laughs> the ideas, questions at least. Yeah, all the ideas in my head that, uh, so the, so just quickly, the short answer, how we got here, sales and marketing, sales and marketing ruins everything. And, and that's, that's the sad reality. So, you know, you, you, we can go somewhere new, but sales and marketing will come in there and ruin anything that gets created. It's just the sad reality of how that, that works. Um, but, you know, I'm, I was think I, I've been thinking about this as a lot, a lot as well. Um, and I, and I was thinking about it last night because my daughter stumbled across a bunch of old YouTube videos that are out there that I made w with Corey Spencer. I saw the one today that was actually really good. Which one, the, um, social media, which one was it? The, the, the Yammer one, the Yammer one. Yeah. So she was sending me all these and just laughing. And one of them she sent me was a, a community service announcement that we did. I miss working with Corey. So Corey and I worked together at, um, at a previous employer and, um, just, man, we, we, we were a creative force. We did some fun stuff. So anyway, we, I, I, I was looking at this video my daughter sent me last night where we made this kind of public service announcement of not spamming our Twitter timelines. You know, Twitter is meant to be a place where we go and collaborate and all of a sudden all these advertisers are just out there spamming it. And it's a very funny clip. Well, I'll have to see if we can link it up on the show notes. If you grab this off of our 33 tangents website. Um, but you know, I'm like, it's, it's true. And this was like 10 years ago, we made that video and it was a problem way before that. I remember back in the early days of Twitter, it was just such a fun free form place to connect. And the conversations were not heavy at all. It was like mm -hmm. just stupid stuff we talked about and hanging out with our friends and complaining about, you know, basketball team not doing well. And it was just, it was just a fun place to be. But you could tell like 2009, 2010, like, uh oh, here comes the marketers, right? And and now it's like I mentioned a keyword and, and then I'm going to get hit up by 50 people. Oh, well, we sell this or we do that or we can help you with that promo. I'm like, look, I'm not looking for you guys' help. You know, like leave me alone. And that was kind of the beginning. It's like, oh, we've, we've, we've lost this beautifulness that was Twitter. And um, it happens all the – everywhere. You know, it happens on Facebook. It happens on – it happens on all of these platforms. It happens on search. It's, you know – advertisers are are basically defining what our experiences are and i think i had a tweet you know of course we had to have a tweet for it um no no pun intended here about the fact that if you don't have a business model the default business model is to sell ads and an ad business model is a crappy business model from a consumer experience perspective all you have to do your your son might not be old enough yet but I should see if I could get some video of my six year old on the iPad. Like he's probably like one look around to see if dad's around before he drops some swear words about the ads ruining his experience. He just has had it. He's and I, and it's funny cause I'll be in here working. And I'll hear him in the other room, like cursing the ads. Like if I see another ad, that's it. No more ads. That's it. You're out. <laughs> you know, he just, but it, you know, it's how these games work on, you know, so he'll download a game from the app store and it's free 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 oh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna inundate you with ads like you every every turn you make we're gonna show you a 30 or 60 second ad it is so annoying think about newspapers newspapers a lot of them have no vision and they have no idea how they're gonna make money so what do we do oh let's slap a bunch of ads on there let's create a one page article and let's break it up into 10 pages and put 50 ads on each page it's a crappy experience you know twitter it's free Let's 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 monetize it and give advertisers a way to attack these people and shove their message down people's throats. And it's it's just not a fun experience. So I blame sales. I blame marketing for, for ruining all of these experiences. It doesn't have to be that way. It's just ninety nine point nine cent ninety nine percent of marketers and sales out there are lazy and they, they're not willing to put in hard work. And 
and lazy, it, they're lazy because it works. Like if, if, if I can do it lazy or I can do the hard work and the hard work maybe only pays off one penny more, why would I do it the hard way? You know? So I think we as consumers need to really start pushing back a lot harder because they're, you know, these lazy sales and marketers are completely ruining everything that, that we love. And it's mm-hmm. frustrating. Well, it, you made me think of something there and it's actually a, a recent change in, in my behavior. So um, it's ne- it's not necessarily our business model, but there's a couple other podcasters out there where their business model is there's a free version mm-hmm. and then there's a paid version. And I mean, we're not talking a significant amount of money. You're talking five, 10, 10 bucks a month or so. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the more I thought about it is, is, you know, obviously I can't, you know, pay every podcaster I listen right. to, but like those that I really listen to make it a point, you know what, sign up for the premium version. So that, you know, either to, to, so they can one, keep it going, make sure it's high quality, but then at the same time, they don't have to default to, to the ad space, Um, you know, having to go insert ads into, into the content. Um, Same thing with, with, with software, like I'm not burning cash and paying for everything, but like, you know, at this point, like, like, do you remember back like 20 years ago, like software, a piece of software cost you 40 bucks. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, and now people these days they, they they freak out like if you're asking them for a buck ninety nine right, for, right. for 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 a piece of software, and I'm like you know making it a point. You know what? Like yeah, like the the the, the software that I really use, make it a point to get the premium version to at least flip the developers, yeah. the creators, the content creators, um, some money mm-hmm. to. Yeah. To, to, to either improve the product, not have to go with, you know, the, the, the ads or the offers. And I mean, I'm going totally completely off base, but like, that's the first thing I thought of is, is that's actually a change in my behavior recently is, is, you know, those that, you know, that content that I consume often, the products I consume often, make sure to get like some level of paid version so that you don't have to go down that ad route. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Uh, this episode of 33 Tangents is brought to you by NordVPN. You know those creepy guys out in the van out in front of your house that are still in your Wi-Fi? With NordVPN, you don't have to worry anymore. Jim and I, we use NordVPN and we love it. All right. Sorry. Oh, that's yeah. great. Sorry. Yeah, hate, that, that's funny. I, I hate having to do that. Um <laughs> <laughs> but you're you're right, and it's it's one of the things I've been I've been hooked on Twitch lately and watching a bunch of game streamers and 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 chess streamers on Twitch, and it's it's very um, fulfilling to me to see how generous viewers are on people's Twitch's account where they're flipping them a few bucks here and there. It's like this is what we need because if we don't, then people are going to either stop creating content. And there's so many amazing content creators out there that that would be incredibly sad, or they're going to default to the ad model. And this whole experience is going to be, to be ruined. So like, Mm -hmm. you know, I just think about it. Like we we're, we've been accustomed to getting everything for free. Like we don't have to pay for music anymore. No one's going to buy a CD. Like, you know, I'm not going to pay for this. Everything's just free on the internet. It's like, no, like these people are putting a tremendous amount of work into creating content. And if you value it, damn it, you should at least pay for it in some way. And it doesn't have to be massive, like, but just something. Otherwise, if you don't pay for it, you're going to pay for it with your attention. You're going to pay for it with having to divert your attention to ads. And it's just, it, it just, not only does it ruin every experience, I think marketing and sales specifically with, with ads is at the core of the toxicity that we see on social media. Um, So I'll take Twitter for example, but Facebook is no different. LinkedIn is no different. Although I think LinkedIn has done a better job of keeping a lot of the crap content off the platform. It's still not there, but it's no Facebook, that's for sure. (laughs) Um, And it's no LinkedIn. But these networks, they're getting paid by advertisers. That's how they're making their money. And so if you, you notice like years ago, um, they made the determination that content was not going to be linear on either of those three platforms. The content is not linear. Mm -hmm. Um, if, you know, if you post a tweet, it's not, okay, well, Jim's seeing Jason's tweet because he tweeted two seconds ago. No, 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 that's not how this works. There's an algorithm behind the scenes that determines which tweets Jim sees, which is frustrating, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and the same with Facebook, if you follow 50 people, 
there's a chance that you're going to not see content because it's not a linear stream of all the content you follow. Facebook is deciding what content Jim should see. Mm-hmm. Did and you that see the social me. dilemma? I did. I did. Mm-hmm. And I very much resonate with, with that. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the social dilemma, if you haven't seen it, does an amazing job of dramatizing exactly what we're talking about here. Like there, there's the one, you know, they, you, you start to see the, the, you know, they're basically triplets and it's the people that are like controlling the, the individual yeah. person and like what to show them and what to do this and what to do that. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, you know, inject this ad or, yes. Oh, he hasn't you know, logged in in a while, send him an email and tease him. And it's funny when I really cut out, Facebook. I, it was funny enough. I started getting those, those emails after we watched the social dilemma mm. and my wife, it was like, is this really how it works? I'm like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. oh, you know, yeah. it's the algorithm is tweaked to keep your eyeballs on there yeah. to sell ads and to keep your eyeballs on there. Like one of the things people don't realize is that outrage is more addicting than joy. That's right. That's right. So the algorithm is tweaked to get, you know, to, to, to keep you outraged. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> so like, it's going to show you your friends that you have some level of disagreement with. That's right. And show you less of your friends where there's a level of agreement. That's right. Um, and so you're, you're going to get that. It's going to keep your eyeballs on there and they're going to sell more ads. But then in that one particular scene where, you know, they're, it's there, you know, most of the movie, or at least most of the dramatization part it's just that one one person and then the three guys controlling them, yeah. and then it starts to pan out, and you see all the pods. Yeah, and she's like, my wife is like, that is really creepy. I'm like, that is an accurate representation of yeah. what is going on. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's scary, and and I and I've seen it firsthand with specifically with Facebook. There's some anecdotal kind of evidence that I've seen where like I'll see a very um, hot button topic like right now it's it's political in nature or Mm -hmm. about the pandemic um and i think someone i follow posted and they were posting about um mask mandates and how wearing masks is part of this plan for the government to control people it was like this like conspiracy theory stuff and i'm like Mm -hmm. why is this i haven't heard from this person in forever and so i clicked onto their wall and i'm like wait a minute, this person has moved, they've had a kid, they've had like all this stuff going on in their life in the last year. And the one thing I see for them that Facebook bubbles up into my feed is this like conspiracy theory stuff around COVID. And I'm like, this is, this is not good. Um, so I, I, I abandoned Facebook for all intents and purposes. Um, and, um, earlier this year, um, I, I left Twitter for over a month. Um, and I'm back on it now and we can kind of talk about how I use it and why I'm, I'm back on it and some of the, the fallout I've saw from not being there. Um, but just on a, on a personal level, to me, it's, it's very hard um, because I get a lot of fulfillment from Twitter and that I feel like I learn a lot. Um, and it's frustrating to me that, that Twitter is controlling the content I see because I want to see what I want to see. And I've learned a lot about a lot of different subjects over the years from people I follow on Twitter. So just from a, what should I be thinking about and learning about in our industry? It's been a goldmine for, for me, but not only that. And I think the hardest thing for me about just completely walking away from social media is I look at the friendships and, and connections I've made on social media. And I think about amazing people that have helped me personally. I've, you know, I've, I, I, you know, I had the flood and the mudslide and the people that showed up to help unbury the house out of the mud were people I had met on Twitter that I had never met in real life. And that never would have happened. Like, that's amazing. You know, they never, I, those people never would have been there excuse me, had I not been on Twitter. And I think about that a lot. I think about, you know, people I've met that have helped build our business that have helped me on personal projects that again, if Twitter wasn't there, I never would have crossed paths with these people. So I do think about that a lot. I think about the fact that it has shrunk the world and my ability to connect and meet and make true friendships with, with people um, that I would never have the opportunity to, to do so. I have a hard time letting go of that and giving that up. 
Mm -hmm. So, but I did, I, I did leave Twitter, um, for a month by design that I was going to leave for a month and reevaluate things in January. And I, and I did that. Um, I found myself feeling mentally much, much clearer and, and happier and healthier. Um, I, I will tell you there was almost an immediate impact um, and an immediate impact going back on, almost like turning on and off a faucet. Do you want to, do you want to take a gander at what that was? Either rage or panic attacks? No, nope, neither. Neither. Okay. The, just the need to constantly check then. No business. Okay. So me being off of social media almost instantly dries up our lead funnel. Hmm. Me being on social media the funnel, the, the faucet turns right back on. And I don't even need to be talking about 33 sticks or business. Just me being there seems to be highly cor correlated with people interested in doing business with us. And so that's really my dilemma is like, I'm our sales and marketing. And if that's where our leads are coming from and I'm not there, I have to either find another way to do it, or I have to find a way to be there but do so in a more deliberate manner. And so that's what I've decided to do. I'm, I'm back on Twitter and I'm very active there. Um, I've decided to be much less of a consumer. So while I follow 600 or 700 people, there's only a handful of people that I actually read their content. So I use curated lists and I only really consume the content of a handful of people. Um, so that's number one. Number two, I've made a pledge to myself to not get involved in any kind of discussions that are outside my realm or any hotbed topics. So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not going to get into online debates, even about sports. Like it doesn't have to be like, even if it's just like people are debating, you know, right now, Philly fans hate Utah fans because of Donovan Mitchell and whatever the dude in Philly that can't hit a three pointer. Um, <laughs> You, you know, like there, there's so much fighting going on about that. And it'd be so easy to get sucked in. I'm like, nope, there's no value to me in, in doing that. Like who cares if Ben Simmons is better than Donovan Mitchell or Donovan Mitchell is better than like, I'm not, I'm not getting paid based on that. I'm, there doesn't matter to me. Right. Like it's just, mm -hmm. it's entertainment. So why am I going to go fight with a bunch of fans about who's a better basketball player? There's no value to me in that. And so I've made a very strong commitment to myself that I'm not going to get involved in any of those conversations. And it's been hard. There's been a couple of times where I was this close to like hitting send on a tweet and I'm like, Nope, I can't do it. And that to me has been amazing. And then I've also made a commitment to myself to, to really focus on, on three things. Number one, I want to talk about and post things about food because that's what I'm passionate about. I want to post things and talk about things around 33 sticks and how we're doing business differently because I'm insanely passionate about that and think the world needs a change and how business is done. And three, I just want to post uplifting and happy content that supports people. And that's it. If, if, if my tweet doesn't fit into one of those three categories, why I'm not sharing it. I don't need to create more content just to create more content. So that's my framework. So I'm back on social media. I'm back on there because it's critical for our business. I'm back on there because I want to connect and meet people I couldn't otherwise connect with, but I'm doing so being very, very deliberate because I know that just one step to the side, I'm going to step, step in a giant bucket of manure, toxic waste, or who knows, just not good stuff, you know? Yeah. And I think you going in with a plan like that, <clears throat> um, helps prevent you from kind of getting sucked into the mess that is social media. Yeah. So like I've been telling my wife, you know, since she's taken her break, her mood has definitely changed. Yeah. You know, she's not sitting there scrolling endlessly or getting upset about, Do you see this person boosted this or this person shared that, like getting all upset. She, she stopped. And I mean, she does, she misses interacting with, with people. Um, and she's kind of doing the same thing that you've done is she's going to re-engage um, yeah. next month. Um, but she's like, she's going to go in with a plan. The first thing is, is she's going to use the, um, the screen time uh, function on, oh, yeah. on her yeah. phone to, to like, you know, put put a timer, put a governor on how much time she spends using social media apps. Mm -hmm. So, this way she's not just endlessly scrolling for hours. And the first thing, you know, that, that quickly showed her like, you know, that the reporting from that week over week was showing her how much time 
she was wasting just endlessly checking those yeah. th those applications. Uh, then the next thing is, is she's actually going to go trim back her friend list. You know, she was someone over the years, like anybody she would meet, yeah, you know, be my friend kind of thing. So like, she's, she's like half these people I haven't even talked to. And really I want this to be a place where, um, you know, I, I, I could see updates on like people, their kids, their life, you know, you know, share pictures of our kid and you know and whatnot. So I think she's going to dial back the the list of people, um, and then she's I think she's also kind of working on the same framework of of an approach like just keep it light and fun. Show pictures of what we did over the weekend or or stuff like that, and try to avoid like the the hot button topics because you know with with with, with social media like you know those kind of things whether it's sports politics whatever they don't go anywhere. They're not productive debates. Right. They're like, not productive conversations. This? Yeah. I mean, if, if we're, if we're looking for new ideas, if we're looking to be challenged, if we're looking to learn and expand our, our knowledge, I think that's fine. But if we're just in there, like as a debate, as a debate, like fighting, like fans fight in the, sh like there's to what purpose, you know? And again, I go back to the sports thing. It's like, you know, and people were asking me, like, are you feeling down today about this loss or that loss? I'm like, why? I'm not an owner of this team. Like, if they win or lose, it doesn't impact my my pocketbook. Why would I put my mental health, you know, like, what do you think about what this is? I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'll watch it for the entertainment value, but I'm not going to engage in getting angry or frustrated or mad on social media over it because it's not my team. It's not my company. I don't own it. You know, I'm just a I'm just a viewer. And, and that's okay. It's okay to, to say that and be in that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think I was telling you about it. I was telling another friend um, when uh, I was talking with them a couple months ago, there was an article I read uh, a while back and it talks about how you have decision fatigue. Like there, there is such a thing like as decision fatigue, you're, you're the, 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 the theory, the hypothesis, which I mean, I think it, it feels totally accurate because I know this feeling your, your brain can only process so many decisions in a day. You can only contemplate so much before you're like, I'm done. I've exhausted it for today. I need, I need a break. And I mean, the context of the article was, is like talking about like technology executives and where they basically wear the same type of clothes day in and day out. And it's, it, the, the reason is, is, you know, you know, obviously the, 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 the biggest example of Steve jobs in the jeans and the black turtleneck yeah. was that, um, you know, he recognized early on eliminate as many decisions as possible or uh, eliminate as many needless decisions or debates as possible. You know, is what I'm wearing to the office every day, does that impact the product? Yeah. No. So let's eliminate the need to debate what I'm wearing to the office today. So I can, you know, have the capacity to deal with something else. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of giggling inside because before you started talking about that, I was looking at my shirt in the video feed. I'm like, people are going to probably say, wait a minute. Hasn't Jason worn that shirt for the, like the last 10 podcasts? So, <laughs> Not going to lie. The, uh, the episode we recorded last week, I put one shirt on and then I was taking a look at uh, the two videos prior. I'm like, I wore that shirt two weeks ago. <laughs> I am going to go change my shirt. So no, uh, not going to lie. I have been presented with that, yeah. but it, it, you know, in, in the context of social media, like if you're constantly bickering with people, if you're constantly worrying about what somebody else wrote, or I have to think of a good comeback, you know, that's not just time that you're wasting. It's, it, it's effort. It's, yeah. it's, it's capacity. You know, we can't, and it, it's, it's, it's something that I have realized, like the days where either like I have a slew of meetings that I'm not just, not just meetings where I can sit there and, you know, just kind of listen in and, uh, multitask like meetings where I have to be a, one of the main contributors or trying to make decisions. And, you know, if I have a string of those, like, I'm, I'm like, I'm beat. Yeah. And my wife would be like, what do you want for dinner? I'm like, I don't care. What do you want this? Yeah, that's fine. Or what about this? I'm like, that's fine. Well, we'll make a decision. I'm like, I told you either is fine with me. Like, I, I can't think of anything else or it's the, you know, my, my parents want us to come over tonight. I'm like, please, no, I, I not tonight. Like I am shot. I don't feel like talking to anybody right now. Like I just want to chill out. Yeah, no, it's, it's very true. And I think, um, 
I think Seinfeld uh, realized that in one of the episodes. Remember when um, Jerry's getting his kitchen redone and then George builds a, a, a bed under his desk at Yankee Stadium? Yes. And the guy's like, okay, do you want the door handle this one or this one? Okay, I can do it any way you want it. Do you want this hinge or that? He's like, just do it. I don't care. Make a decision. I can make all these decisions. Just do it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, and it's, you know, we see it all the time. Um, I think people building a house, let's see it. I've never, well, I've built a house. Um, and then our first house, we built the house. So it's like when you buy a new house, but it's built and you kind of get a pick out where well, you can choose from these three floors and you can choose from these five countertops. Even that was like overwhelming to me. I'm like, I don't care. Just pick something. I don't want to, I don't want to have to make all these decisions. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 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 So like, I mean, if you think about it, like if, if you're constantly worrying about social media, if you're constantly, um, and I do want to pivot this conversation into something else. That's where I'm trying to take us. So if you're, you're constantly doing that, like where else in your life is, are, are you suffering? And the one thing the social dilemma totally points out is, is these tools are meant to be addictive. These tools oh, yeah. are meant to be a time suck. These yeah. tools are meant to not be a tool. Like I, I love the one analogy. The one guy brings up, he's like, you have a hammer. The hammer's waiting in your garage or your shed or your workroom. It's there when you need it. It's waiting for you. He goes, these things, these social media things, you know, these social media apps that we call tools don't behave that way. They're like, hey, come here and use me. Hey, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. You know, kind of kind of flagging, flagging you down. So it, it's you you're constantly using it. Yeah. Um so yeah, I, I think we've kind of beat that 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 topic uh, to death. And but um, where I want to go next, where I was, what would kind of dawn on me as we were talking through that, is the other aspect of you know sp- you know in in the in the idea of like spending all this time worrying about what you're posting. It's you know people like they they post a different version of themselves, which is also not healthy. They yeah. they post the version of what they want everybody to see that this perfectly curated version and it's nothing like who they really are. If I'm, if I'm rehashing the story, I apologize, but it's a super good story. So I think uh, I know a story you're going to tell. It's great. Go ahead. So, um, absolutely. This happens all the time. In fact, before I get to that story, I'm going to have to track down this website but there's this website that exposes Instagram influencers where they take really tight crops of photos to make it look like something that it's not like they're in this spectacular location, but it's just like this little corner on a, you know, and, and yeah, that's what we've become. We've become our own um, reality show producers. And we're, we're, you know, talking to the control room to tight zoom in on a shot to make it look like something better than it really is. Mm-hmm. And, um, the one, the one visual I have that is so telling to this is, um, a mutual friend of ours, Jesse was in, in town in Salt Lake city. Uh, this was several years ago and we had, um, we had breakfast up at the, uh, the little America hotel in Salt Lake city. Um, and Jesse and I were sitting out on the patio having breakfast and this, this family comes in and it, it looks like, I'm like, hold on my ear thing is buzzing um my this family comes in and they look like they were walking right off of a movie set i mean clothes were perfect makeup was perfect hair was perfect i'm like what is going on here um and they've they've got these cameras and they've got these little tripods and stuff set up everyone like what the crap uh and and they sit down to start eating and and it's like, oh, baby, you look so good today. Oh, baby. Mm, oh, the kids are perfect. And then all of a sudden it stops. Like, would you stop doing that? Would you put that in your mouth? When I tell you, I'm like, what, the, what is going on? This is so weird. <laughs> and this this went on for like our entire lunch. And Jesse and I moved inside. We grabbed some coffee. And there's a little toy shop inside. And uh, about 15 minutes later, here comes the family down the, the hall. Um, and the kids are just begging to go in this little toy store and the parents are like, no, we're not doing that. Get your butt in the car. We're and I'm like, what? it was the weirdest, most bizarre experience I've ever been in. And come to find out they had a reality show on, on TLC, I think TLC network. 
Um, and, and they're basically kind of, this was a, a non production shoot day, but they, where they go out and they use their cell phones or whatever and shoot behind the scene shots of their real life. Right. Oh, so made up versions of yeah what their real life is supposed to be. That's right. Because, you know, when the camera crew is there, that's kind of, you know, made up a little bit, but this is going to give the viewers the real view of what their real life is like. We're just going to pull out our cell phones and, and capture it. It was anything but right. Like mm-hmm. the minute they said action, like we're playing a role, and then and then it was back to their real real life that no one was capturing except Jesse and I watching. I'm like, this is sad, right? Like this is what we're doing, but it's 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 so true, and and you know we we do it all the time. We see it on on social media and you see people get depressed and frustrated because you see these feels like, Oh, these other people just, it's just perfect. And everything they do is perfect. I'm like, no, no, no. they're showing you like 1% of what's happening in their life. And even that 1% is faked because they're putting a tight crop on the photo. They're, they're, they're showing it the way you want us. They want you to see it. It's not giving you the step back view of what's going on in reality. And, um, I think I think I've been told, and I it just showed up on my feed a couple of weeks ago. But Instagram has been pulling off like counts um, mm-hmm. from photos, um, kind of trying to devalue that whole self worth and how good the content is by showing the number of, of likes, which I think is a is a really interesting move. But it's it's t- yeah, I mean, this has very real impacts and. You know, we're, we're, we're curating this lifestyle and it's, it's gotta be like a drug because it's not the lifestyle we're living. So what are we getting out of it? Like a a hit like that, Mm -hmm. that posting that one picture is a hit, but it's never enough. So we need to post more and more and more. It's like, why not just work on creating the life you want instead of curating a false image of, of what it is, because it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's addicting. You know, one of the things they've, they've found is, is. So from, from a food perspective, sugar, for example, mm-hmm. they found sugar is just as addic- addicting, if not more addicting than cocaine. It lights up the same receptors in the brain that cocaine yeah. does. Yeah. Well, what they're now finding is all of these finely tuned alerts and buttons and notifications are doing the exact same thing. Mm. They're lighting up the same receptors in the brain that um, the drugs light up. Um, or at least, you know, drugs like, like a co- cocaine, heroin, whatever it's, it's those dopamine hits. So it's the, um, uh, you know, again, go, referencing the social dilemma again, you know, you've got the girl, she posts a picture and nobody likes it right. or a few people like it. Right. So, and it's, it's a real picture of her. It, it's a real one. Nobody likes it. So she right. deletes it and uh, it takes this like totally contrived posed yeah. phony version that's got a filter on it and everybody yeah. likes it and she's happy again yeah um because you you've got that that dopamine hit yeah. um so yeah like there is definitely it, it's a level of addiction for sure yeah for for sure um and if we're not already seeing it i'm guessing we're gonna see like recovery centers for specifically that right where mm-hmm. people are gonna go and just like they go and for, for treatment for withdrawal from drugs, I'm guessing they're probably already going for treatment for withdrawal from social media likes. Yeah. yeah sure. like, because you've got the, this mental health issue um, that that's being driven by, by these applications. Like, I mean, I have jokingly said it, but half serious said it like, you know, the first couple of days, my wife deleted all the apps, blocked all the URLs and everything. I'm like, you're, you're going through a bit of the DTs, aren't you? You're, you're going through a bit of withdrawal. And she says, yeah, I am, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's kind of subsided a bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Um, and I like your, your thought around the, the hammer. I, I like the concept of, because for me, I don't, especially in the industry we work in, it's, it's near impossible for sh- us to shut off all these things. And I think about mm-hmm. that as well. Like we have to be informed on these things because it's what our clients are using. So we have to have some level of understanding how these things work. So I don't think all of us have the luxury of just shutting it off all the time, but I like the concept of use the tools to make what you want to make. Don't let the, don't let the tools control you. And that's hard because an, a hammer is an animate object. It's just kind of sitting out there in the shop. You can control when you're going to use it with social media. It's not to your point. Like 
the the algorithms are specifically built to, for you to crave it and pick it up and if you don't then you're going to get push alerts and emails and so it's much much harder but i i really like that visual and concept of controlling the tools that you have and not letting the tools that you have control mm -hmm. you yeah, I, I can't take credit for it. It came from the the social dilemma. They did yeah. mention it, but it was something that stuck out because people think of these things as tools. They think of social media as tools, but they're a little uninformed. They, you know, when they think of a tool, they 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 compare, you know, their Facebook profile to a hammer. Well, again, yeah, like you said, the hammer is not proactively trying to get you to use it. Right. It's there when you need it, when you have an idea. So you know, if you want to treat social media like a tool, um, like whether it's part of, you know, your, your, your marketing plan, um, it's part of your community outreach, then you have to go in with an intention on how to use it. If not, you become used. Yeah. Agreed. Um, Agreed. Uh, and I think that that's right. And, and, and I guess my two pieces of advice is on a personal level, don't just use it organically. Don't just use social platforms organically. Um, if I've learned anything from kind of taking a hiatus and really thinking about how to use it is there's massive value in being engaged on these platforms, but you have to be deliberate in how you're going to use it. If not, it's going to use you. You're going to be putty in its hands and it's going to mold you in what it wants you to do. If you can be deliberate in how you use it, you can take control of that to, to some degree. And I'd also say to marketers, do better, you know, do better. You're, you're the problem that, that we're having here. You're, you're directly causing this, this challenge and you're having a massive negative impact on the world. Do better. And they can, because, you know, you can absolutely do better marketing and sales on social media, but it takes a long-term play instead of a short-term play. And mm -hmm. where we're so driven by quarterly results, that's why we, you know, that's why it's it's devalued into what it has. But if marketers start taking a longer term play and they start looking at social platforms as truly a way to engage with customers, potential customers, and engage on levels that are more about building relationships than about trying to trick people into buying um, or trick people into seeing more ads, then I think we can we can make a drastic shift in in how social um, is integrated into our lifestyles. But until then, until marketing and sales is willing to step up and feel like they have a role to play in this, it's going to continue to just get worse, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so to start wrapping it up, one of the things I've been thinking about is, is people like our age and younger probably don't realize that one of the major arguments and sales pitches for people to start signing up for cable TV in the early 80s was that with cable TV, there'd be no commercials. You're paying a subscription fee, so it's commercial-free content. Well, that's gone that, out quick, the <laughs> and that went out the window very quickly. Yeah. Um, and there's there's commercials all over the place. So, but um, you know, Suzanne's asked me, she goes, Where do you think we go from from here? And I'm like, I'm waiting for the subscription subscription based social media platform to rear its head. Somebody's got to be working on it. And, you know, with the argument of there's no ads because you're paying however much a month, you know, it's cheaper, you know, it's maybe it's 10 bucks a month, which that you spend more on your daily cup of coffee over a course of a month than you would for this. Um, but there's no ads, nor do we curate and sell your data. Because that's the one thing we we haven't really gotten a chance to get into today. We're running out of time. Is how these social media companies they didn't get to be this big by just serving ads. They're curating your data and selling it. Yeah. So if someone were to come along and say no ads and your data is one hundred percent private and kept in house, we're not curating it. We're not selling it. That's what I'm waiting for because. I think people are becoming savvy to how their data is collected. And we're going to have a follow-up conversation on the whole cookie conversation, Google's yeah. announcement last week. That that That's an episode I'm working with Jen on. Awesome. Um, we're going to talk about that because the one thing I want to say is, is I, I, I do see the whole cookie conversation as a distraction because mm -hmm. the real problem is a lot of these platforms create, you know, um, collecting your data, 
and create and selling it off to to third parties. Like someone said, the, the the volume of data Facebook gets today, like all it takes is seven interactions from someone, and they know exactly who you are. They know what what pisses you off. They know what makes you happy. They know what political end of what what end of the political spectrum you're on. They know all of those details, so they know not just how to tailor ads, but how to keep your eyeballs on there. Right. It, it's true. No, that, and I think both of those are, are fascinating discussions. I look forward to the uh, the cookie conversation with with Jen. Um, and I, I agree. I, I it probably creates different problems, but I would absolutely pay ten dollars a month for Twitter. <laughs> I think it instantly changes a lot of conversations because people now have to make a decision: do I want to pay ten dollars just to be a troll online every month? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it helps clean up a lot of the, the noise in the community. And it also helps change the paradigm that now we're not just using ads as our default paradigm for making money. And it, it, it changes the way brands and people are, are, are forced to interact. I would, I would absolutely pay that for sure. Oh yeah. yeah. If, if someone came along and said, here, here's a platform, it's ad free. Your data is 100% private. It doesn't leave the building. Yeah, it's only used to to improve the platform. I I pay ten bucks a month for it. Yeah. So and I and I know at this point someone's working on it. It's going to rear its head. Yeah. Because people are becoming more and more aware of of how these tools are are using you. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's gonna be an interesting few years here. Lots of stuff yeah. changing. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, this hour flew by. It this did. was this was a lot of fun. Yeah, agreed. Good conversation. Yeah, lots of fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what other people think when we when we post this. You know, like has their again, I go back to our original questions. Has their opinion of social media changed over the last decade or so? Um, and have they changed how they how they approach it? Yep. Yeah. Let us know. We'd love to hear your your thoughts. Cool. Well, thank you much, right. and uh, yep. catch everybody later. Mm -hmm.